My name is Philippa Brown. Thank you for asking me, or perhaps I invited myself actually, to give this art talk. Thea asked me to say a little bit about myself. So I, I became an art therapist a very, very long time ago. Um, I went to art school and uh, it wasn't the happiest experience for me, I have to say. And, and then I did the art therapy postgraduate diploma at St Albans School of Art uh, here and found something that has stayed with me throughout my life, throughout my adult life. And if I look back, I think probably I was an art therapist right from a very early age, really. Um, that kind of thinking about or being curious about people and uh, the way that they make art to express themselves. It's probably always been there and I remember it when I was at school in the, in the, in the art class. Um, I worked in mental health after qualifying and for, in a psychiatric hospital and then I worked for MIND which uh, is a voluntary charity, I worked for a int very interesting project in the centre of London. And then in 1994 I came here and uh, until December 2016, I was the programme leader here for the MA Art Therapy, which was a fantastic, rewarding job and where I met many of these familiar faces here. So my experiences in mental health, adult mental health, um, and so much of, this, much of this lecture in a way is informed by my experience as an art therapist, a kind of way of thinking psychologically about art and the aesthetic aspects of art. Now that I've left the university, I'm doing some supervision, which is very rewarding. So art therapists come to me to talk about their practice and I help them think about that. And I'm doing a little bit of teaching. Um, I've just been to Lithuania. I've been speaking to the Lithuanians. <laughs> about my time in Lithuania teaching supervision and, and here I am as an, as doing an art talk. So this talk is actually about creativity. I came last year and did the design talk um, and talked about creativity in relationship to design. So I've sort of taken that and rejigged it a bit. So I'm going to really just ask you before I give my lecture and I, I am going to read a lot of it uh, because I find that kind of keeps me on track. But how many of you here think of yourselves as naturally creative? Put up your hands if you think, are you naturally creative? Ooh, that's virtually the whole room. Does anyone think that it's something that you learn, you have to learn? Put up your hands. Mm, a few of you. So maybe it's a bit of both. Is it a bit of both? Something you learn and something. Okay, so as creativity is at the heart of the human condition, from conception to death, the main thrust of my lecture is that it is a process. And with that comes a search for meaning. In art and design and art therapeutic practice, this search comes out of an authentic encounter where there is differentiation on one hand, and making and discovering of something new on the other. As much as artistic creativity is a process, it's also about finding a language and a context in which to communicate. For example, constructing or deconstructing an idea or concept, putting form and function together for the viewer, or untangling complex feeling with a client who's not able to separate fact from fiction. So in painting, the language might blur boundaries between painting, writing and drawing, as in Cy Tomley's 1960s blackboard paintings, which are an abstract, fluid script between these forms of language. These paintings, of course, were emblematic of that era. In photography, the language of the still image fixes a moment in time and where the camera may or may not discriminate against its subject and the subject's surroundings, 
So this is an iconic image taken at the end of the Second World War of the American soldiers raising the flag. And I did deliberately chose it because it's anonymous. We don't know who the photographer is. In art therapy, the language is symbolic. The unconscious made conscious in the context of a therapeutic relationship. And for, the for this woman who made this painting, who came to see me for art therapy after a miscarriage, the colour, shape and associations she made to this image rep began to represent her failed womb. And it was through talking about this image and making it that she was able to face the loss for the first time. In this search for a language, a number of questions raise themselves that can be shared across disciplines. What are the origins of creativity? Is it an innate drive? Where does, and where does it have a, its authenticity lie? Can creativity be transformative? And how can we embrace the contradictions and ambiguities inherent in the creative endeavour? But before I attempt to address these questions, some background on the creative process. So as I said, some of this lecture is informed by my background as an art therapist, so I'm using some psychoanalytical ideas and writers. So in her book, Dying and Creating, the psychoanalyst Rosemary Gordon identifies four key stages of the creative process. And these are the first stage, which is the preparatory stage. Um, we're consciously immersing ourselves in a problem or an idea. We get drawn to something. We're challenged, <coughs> but we actually find ourselves struggling at this stage. But we must persist and we must recognise our ignorance about willingness to learn. And we must have courage. The second stage is a stage of incubation, a particularly painful stage, she says. We sleep on it, literally or metaphorically. We might feel muddled up against the wall. Um, what we produce might be banal and we might have to let it go. But here in this stage, a seed takes root. It may be unseen or unconscious, we're not quite sure. But if we let it grow, we can move on to the third stage. And that's of inspiration or illumination. A sudden flash of light, um, we, testing out our ideas, um, and we feel kind of excited by what's happening. And then the next stage is a stage of verification, a kind of coming down to earth, a realisation about what we've done. Um, but we have to critically test at this stage whether ideas really match up to reality. Now these, I think, are, I mean, there, there are probably lo are quite a number of other writers who give you other stages of the creative process, but I think these are particularly interesting ones. And of course, they may not come in a linear fashion. They might kind of, you might move from one to the others and backwards and forwards. In neuroscience, the theory is that we have a dominance to the right or the left brain. <coughs> the left is analytical, good at figures, science, language. The right brain is creative, intuitive, and where the imagination lies. However, much of the theory on this in terms of dominance um, has been disputed, because to fully realise our cre creative potential beyond imagination as right brain thinkers, we need to harness the left and use our analytic capacities, as the following right brain thinkers have clearly done. Uh, here's a selection, and I'm sure you'll think of many more right brain flinkers. Um, so we've got Freud, Shakespeare, the photographer Annie Levovich, Picasso, Tracy Emin, used her, her uh, left brain to great advantage, David Bowie and um, Ma uh, Maya Angelou, and Pina Bausch, the dancer. And I, they're right across disciplines, these, these people have used both parts of the brain. Historically, creative thinkers, artists and those regarded broadly speaking as creative genius, and I'm not sure 
I would include everybody here as a creative genius, has been closely aligned to being a bit crazy, taking things to extremes, even with actual madness and insanity itself. A study by the psychologist Frank Barron showed that creativity is informed by a host of intellectual, emotional, motivational and moral characteristics. <coughs> the common traits that people across <coughs> all creative fields seem to have in common, according to Barron, are an openness to one's inner life, a preference for complexity and ambiguity, an unusually high tolerance for disorder and disarray, the ability to extract order from chaos, independence, unconventionality and a willingness to take risks. Describing this range of traits, Barron's, Barron is quoted as saying that the creative genius was both more primitive, more cultured, more destructive, more constructive, occasionally crazier, yet adamantly, adamantly saner than the average person. Now, do you recognise anything of those in yourselves? It's probably a good question to ask. So this artist, Yuya Kasama, um, is who I'm going to think about next. There have been many artists, past and present, whose fame has come from a struggle between sanity and madness, and their individual creative depiction of that struggle. Edward Munch, Jackson Pollock, Frida Kahlo, Alice Neal, Louise Bourgeois, to name just a few, and I'm sure you'll think of far more than I have. Yu Kusama's work spans many medium, painting, installation, soft sculpture, print, even designer objects. All notable for her use of bright colours, black and white, and obsessive repetitive dots and patterning. Kusama is recognised within the contemporary art world. She's had a retrospective at Tate Modern. She represented Japan at the Venice Bernali and is currently represented by Victoria Miro. But Kusama has a psychotic illness and since 1997 has chosen to live in a psychiatric hospital just outside Tokyo. Aged 87, she still lives there today and has a, near, a studio nearby which she goes to daily. Her prolific creative output has an extraordinary, extinctive drive behind it. And as her quote suggests, her hallucinations are a source of inspiration. But from a psychological and more therapeutic perspective, it's possible the repetitive patterning that she engages with are a way of her ordering the chaos of her mental illness. And clearly, Kusama has mastered the right and left brain, as it takes discipline and aspiration to construct the kind of body of work that she has for artistic consumption. Creativity as an authentic, innate or instinctive <coughs> drive has long been recognised in the work of the outsider artist. This kind of art is not made, generally speaking, inside a creative art or artistic context. It is created out of a need for self-expression and release the releasing of the imagination and feeling. Aesthetically, it tends to be self-referential and sometimes obsessive in nature and therefore re resides on the other end of the spectrum <coughs> to art represented in contemporary galleries of today, where art speaks to art and looks to reference itself or the cultural context in which it's produced. Origini originally called art brute, art of the untrained eye was followed by artists in the early 20th century, such as Jean de Buffet, who was influenced by the primitive, raw and spontaneous qualities of the imagery. However, in recent years, outsider art has regained some notoriety. For example, in the 2013 Venice Bernali, the most prestigious art festival in the world, big names in the art world were, were placed next to little-known outsiders in a show that deftly presented the world of high art with the creative nuances of, of inner world imagery that were given 
new status and value to those who had little recognition. And I went to the Venice Barnale and it was fantastic. It was wonderful to see these outsider artists which, who make work in this kind of very spontaneous way from dreams and imaginations really being played off against uh, art, high art, high status art. Um, and it was a, it was a fantastic, um, it was a fantastic festival. The first person to really acknowledge the instinctive creative drive of the unknown artist was a German art historian and psychiatrist, Dr. Prince Han Hans Prinzhorn. In the 1920s, Prinzhorn wrote a book titled The Artistry of the Mentally Ill, which I think you can find in the LRC. This is a vast collection of 5,000 drawings, paintings and objects <coughs> ma made by people incarcerated in a psychiatric <coughs> hospital. <coughs> disregarded as insane, with no voice, these forgotten people used scraps of paper, fragments of found materials, or anything they could salvage for self-expression and recognition. Most importantly and unknowingly, they left a legacy of the human need to create through the plastic visual arts. And there was a very interesting exhibition called Beyond Reason that showed at the Hayward Gallery in the mid-1990s, which was a sample of Prince Orne's collection. And you will find that catalogue in the LRC. It's a, it was a great catalogue, particularly if you're writing about this relationship between art and outsider art. This is Judith Scott, who was born with Down syndrome. And I would describe her as an outsider artist with an insider profile. She was born deaf and she never learned to speak. For the first seven years of her life, she lived with her family in California until she was institutionalized for 35 years and which must have been a pretty traumatic uh, place to, have, to, to, been, to have been taken to. However, in 1995, she was effectively rescued by her twin sister, she was a twin, um, who found her place in a supportive um, environment for people with learning disabilities called Creative Growth Arts Centre. In her first years at Creative Growth, uh, Judith focused on drawing and she did lots of um, drawings of, of circular gestures. Then, after attending a series of fibre-based workshops with a textile artist, an extraordinary transformation of Judith's creative process took place. And you can see here some of the objects that she made through binding, winding, stitching, weaving and knotting threads, strings, raffia, bits of cloth, tubing, plastic, over, round, through the found object. She created over 200 artworks of visceral, bodily and sensory quality. She, Judith never spoke about her art. She never found any words. But she actually found an unstoppable language in the process of making the object. Eventually, these extraordinary objects were found a critical eye in the art world, who discovered her and her collection, and with her per sister's permission, began to show them in galleries and museums. And these are some photographs I took when I went to um, the Museum of Everything, which is a a very fantastic collection of outsider art and they showed Judith's work in a in a disused um, hotel I in Oxford Street and it was the most wonderful space um, it was sort of in, you know semi-industrial space because it had all been stripped back and the work was hanging in this space and the they were the shadows they were ha they had a really beautiful quality of um, uh, in relationship to the space and that's why I call her an outsider with an insider profile. <laughs> so if you're interested in working with learning disabilities and you're interested in this kind of again this crossover between um, art that's shown in galleries and uh, the, the, the artist who's working really from this much more instinctive way she's a, she's a good person to follow up, an interesting person to follow up. So I'm now going to move on and talk about creativity and transformation. 
Around the sa same time as Prinzhorn, the psychoanalyst uh, Carl Jung classified creativity as one of the five main instincts, instincts characteristic of man. The other four being hunger, sexuality, the drive to be active and reflection. Jung's whole life was a search for meaning and the transformative, transformative and healing effects of creativity for inner psychic well-being. On a personal and collective level, Jung likened the healing effects of creativity to that of an achemical process in which base metal, metal could be transformed into gold. Essentially what that means is that you take raw, untamed material, put it in a big cauldron, put it under a fire, and it turns into something glorious, precious, and in therapeutic terms, restorative and reparative. If we use this metaphor of the achemical crucible in therapy, we're kind of, we've got a bit of a pot, pot boiling, perhaps. <laughs> However, as Jung notes here in his quote, the transformational process also requires us to stand back and reflect, and I think that's the case both in therapy and when we're making art. Otherwise, we'll forgo the meaning within it. So we might be in it, boiling up the pot, but we also need to stand back and reflect upon it. Art therapy in the UK owes, has owed much to the original Sorry, I'll start again. Art therapy in the, UK, in the UK owes much of its original approach to Jung's writings on art as healing and its transformational properties. Early pioneers such as Adrian Hill, Edward Adamson, post Second World War, sorry, I've lost my point, took these ideas forward by creating the Open Studio. And I worked a lot as an art therapist with the Open Studio where the patients that I worked with who were mentally ill could come and work very freely um, and express themselves and in what Addison called an asylum within asylum. And I think we do still experience the open studio model um, in some places still. The potential for transformation or change, however small, through the creative process remains central to the art therapeutic experience. And what resides, resides within this dynamic is a relation between creation and destruction. Some clients who come to art therapy may harbour self-destructive, aggressive or angry feelings which they cannot manage on their own. Hence they come into a therapeutic relationship. To destroy, throw away or discard an artwork without having judgment been made on that in the safety of a therapeutic space can be a huge relief to some people. The act of creating then destroying also brings contradictory feelings to the surface for the client but also for the therapist. Should we keep it? Rescue it from the bin? Dispose of it? Work with it again? These are all questions that come up I think in therapy, but they also come up for us as artists. And they hold meaning, and we have to work with them. <laughs> as a supervisor, I support many art therapists encountering such processes with their clients. And my task is to help the therapist stay with, contain, at the same time keep thinking in the face of what at times can be completely overwhelming. <coughs> As David McLagan reminds us, and I've always held on to this quote throughout my professional life, that art therapy is an encounter, and I think he actually says in the quote, a dangerous encounter uh, with chaos, but one which is given value and that can be worked with and through. If the relationship between creating and destruction is valued inside the art therapy space, so too is it regarded a significant aspect of some artist's creative process. And I have two examples of this kind of artistic transformation, one which was highly controversial. 
So the first is Cornelia Parker and her installation, Cold Dark Matter, an Exploded View, 1991. Have you seen it? It often hangs in the Tate. I don't know if it's there at the moment. This is the restored context of a garden shed full of objects. It was exploded by the Bishop Army on the request of the artist. The surviving pieces were then reassembled by Cornelia Parker into an installation that is suspended from the ceiling. Lit by a single light bulb, the fragments cast dramatic shadows on the gallery walls, co creating a really sublime object. And here is the explosion. Parker liked the idea of something happening in a split second. At the same time, it could also be it could also have a lasting quality. She's quoted as saying, an explosion is archetypal, familiar from childhood to adulthood, as is a shed full of childhood objects, dreams and fantasies. She's also known for squashing other sort of destructive processes, like squashing um, precious musical instruments. So destruction and recreation is really quite integral to her art practice. I notice she's the election artist, I'm not sure she's doing much destroying in that <laughs> process, <laughs> but uh, she's uh, something to, yeah, she was elected to be the artist who followed the election the last year, and she's still putting stuff out on Instagram. My second example, and one which is a lot more controversial, is Jake and Dinos Chapman's defacing <coughs> of Goya's original prints, <coughs> The Disasters of War, exhibited in their 2000 exhibition titled The Rape of Creativity. What the Chapman brothers did was buy a complete set of 80 etchings. Have you anybody seen this? So what the Chapman brothers did was they bought a complete set of 80 etchings in mint condition of what is the most revered set of prints in existence. The set printed from the artist's original plates depicted the terrible ravages of war in Spain in the 18th century and it really was the first time that anybody had ever really brought that forward in, in the way that Goya did. So in terms of print connoisseurship, in terms of art history, in any terms, these are <coughs> treasures. But the Chapman brothers systematically went through the entire 80 etchings and changed all the visible victims' heads to clowns' heads and puppies' heads, as if it was a comic strip. And they titled this new work, Insult to Injury. But like rubbing salt in the wound. Now I know there is much more to be said about these two examples and their historical referencing, particularly in the case of the Chapman brothers, but there are some important questions that arise here about what constitutes creative authenticity. The questions are, did the Chapman brothers go about a process of creative adorn adornment that draws the viewer's attention in towards the victim's plight. Further highlighting man's inhumanity to man that Goya portrayed so uniquely. Or have they willfully committed a deliberate act of vandalism that breaks an artistic taboo of the worst kind? There was much debate at the time and I don't have the answer. When I saw this show, it put me into all right, a real dilemma. You know, which way was I to view this? But I fell on the side of creative adornment. And I leave the rest up to you to make up your own minds about what you think. So, it is to play and its importance to the creative process that I now turn. And of course, destruction and reparation reparation are significant aspects of being playful. You all know Grayson Perry. Uh, Grayson Perry is very well known for his views on the importance of play in artistic practice. He's quoted as saying that in playing artists embrace new ideas that may seem suspicious or ridiculous at the time, but when revisited days or even years later can become the basis for brilliant and imaginary work that often breaks new creative ground. When I was writing this, I thought, I wonder if that's what happened to Perry in the process of developing his signature style of ceramics. 
when he embellishes the Greek urn, the shape of the Greek urn, with dark themes of cultural significance, child, child abuse. You know, maybe he made a mark on the outside and then he let it develop over time. All of us have played from early infancy. As young children, we played and created other worlds. We immersed ourselves in an imaginative experience, learnt what was beyond us, and we took risks in a safe way. Play is safe. We test things out in play when we're young. In being playful as children, we learned how as adults to be empathetic and, ref and reflective in our relationships with others. We learn about others in play. In art therapy, being playful and bringing our clients into a state of play is at the centre of our work. And the art therapists in the audience will no doubt recognise that I'm referring to the writings of psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott and his understandings that psychotherapy is the therapist and the client playing together. We have to come together to play. Winnicott's contribution to our understanding of creativity lies in his depth, knowledge of the mother, early mother-infant relationship and how from an early age playing is essential for healthy mental growth. And he most importantly underpins that when the opportunity to play is disrupted, absent or impinged, long-term psychological damage occurs. So Winnicott's key ideas on creativity was that there was an intermediate area of experience between the mother and the child, which he titled the potential space. <coughs> this space here, the creative space. Here is outer world, here is inner world, or mother and infant. This is a very important concept in art therapy practice. Uh, I think it's also an interesting concept for, uh, for artists about moving into a space that is not actually you inside of you or inside of somebody else, it's an in-between space. The cast passage is to play and be alone but in the presence of another, uh, the child playing alone in the presence of the, of the mother, was also another important concept um, that Winnicott that evolved from Winnicott's writing. And different types of play. The symbolic play. And here we have the, the transitional object. I'm sure a lot of you remember your rag doll or teddy bear. That was the thing you held on to, <coughs> particularly when your mother was absent. So it becomes representative of the mother. It's symbolic. It's a symbolic object. Um, and it's really in this intermediate place of experience where the symbolic first is discovered. And messy play. What in Winnicott told the stuff of nonsense. It's nonsense, anything can happen. But what's important about messy play from Winnicott's perspective is that you could really truly find yourself. That you could really discover, that the child really discovers in messy play. A sense of being alive, being real in mind and body a sort of authenticity of feeling. The reverse side of that is a false sense of self, which is more something which is more adaptive. And I think that false sense of self, we as art therapists meet on a kind of frequently, often, daily, when we work with the clients. You may recognize some of these modes of play. As I said, translated into artistic practice, they might be most noticeable in the studio when you forget anyone's around. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. You forget everyone's around. You're totally immersed in the backwards and forwardness of making, doing, thinking, catching thoughts in your provisional prov vision. I see this as a kind of s coming into a state of play for any artist, a kind of creative searching process where we can lose ourselves, find ourselves, let the materials talk to us or stay mute. And this is creativity at its most absorbing. And it comes from that experience of being able to be alone in the presence of another. And then there's doodling. Who in the room is doodling? Who's going to confess to some doodling? Yeah, great, plenty. 
Nice, I like it. <laughs> In his book, The Hidden Order of Art, the art historian Ehrensreich. Now, who here is taught by Michael Wright? Anybody taught by Michael Wright? He's very keen on Aaron Spike. Yes, he, in his drawing classes and... The, yeah, exactly, the hidden order of art. Yeah. Um, and he, and Aaron Spike talks about this unconscious scanning, a kind of unconscious scanning, um, and a, a creative suspension of frontiers, which I think you find in mindlessness um, of the messy play and also in doodling. Artists have been doodling for centuries, yet it has no status, comes from nowhere, <coughs> it's throwaway. It's an unconscious <coughs> searching for a language and a gesture towards something else. Despite its mindlessness, the advantage of doodling is that it is uncentered and creatively releasing. So the doodles that you make have some value. <laughs> Paul Clay took a line for a walk. The surrealists extended the walking line as a collaborative activity in their automatic drawing and their exquisite bodies to reveal unconscious imagery. And contemporary art has witnessed Louise Bourgeois following in this tradition. Doodling in the middle of the night was Bourgeois's way of accessing hidden images in the dark, she allowed the spontaneous mark to lead her, then move into narratives about her own life, from which she built a huge body of work, and I'm sure she's very familiar to a lot of you, from sculpture to installations. And here she is. We've looked at how creativity for some artists is an innate creative drive, how it can be transformative and that play is central. However, these processes are not always linear. They don't always happen in this kind of linear line and are beset with inherent contradictions and ambiguities, both for artists and art therapists. Rosemary Gordon was influenced by Jung and his, his ideas about the shadow. And the shadow for Jung is the darker side of our psyche that exists in all side of us, inside all of us. It's constructed in archetypal opposites sort of love and hate, we feel love and hate, masculine and feminine, darkness and light. And Rosemary Gordon's, in her stages of the, of the creative process that I talked about earlier in my talk, says we must mobilise contradiction and its mutually reciprocal qualities. And she suggests that these are the contradictions. And you probably will know of a lot more than these. Rosemary Gordon says that these are human qualities which we all share and as creative artists and therapists we must take note that contradiction and ambiguity is our friend, not our enemy. So have you ever considered that these might be your friend? Because they often feel like a struggle, like they're in conflict with each other. But actually what she's saying is they have mutually reciprocal qualities and if that we can use them to our benefit. Now I've selected an artist called um, Rebecca Warren to kind of illustrate uh, an artist who works with contradiction um, and ambiguity. Because of course artists have played with contradiction and ambiguity endlessly. Along with irony it might be their greatest strength and of course in play, ambiguity is outed, acted out all the time. One thing might be something, it might be something else, it could be this, it's possible. There's all sorts of possibilities. So Rebecca Warren's art is riddled with playful contradictions and this is a piece on, on the right. It's often unplanned, it looks unfinished, it's un impermanent, certainly the early work that she did. And <coughs> I, I don't know if anybody knows Rebecca Warren's work. Does anybody know her work? No. She, and if anybody's in Cornwall, she's actually got a show at the Tate St. Ives at the moment. Um, I, didn't wa I wanted to use somebody who was current and showing currently in this talk. Um, and I saw this exhibition, her recent exhibition when I was down there recently. And I think she's quite an interesting artist. 
So her early work was sexually provocative, vulgar and shocking. Sculptures were tender, yet also aggressive in their depiction of the female form. And I think these are probably made of air-dried clay. She turns ideas on their head, working from the physical concrete material to reach an idea. So she works out of the material. That's what's really interesting about her and what I think she's got uh, a kind of relevance to art therapists. Um, she lets the material speak to her, the properties of the material, the ambiguity of the material. She uses found objects such as air-dried clay, as I said, and she combines wood with neon. So there's kind of lots of contradiction, ambiguities in, in the materials. The abstract collides with the figurative, hard meets soft. We've got steel and the fluffy pom-pom. High art meets low art. She references and offsets films, popular culture of classical sculpture. Feeling and intellect, mind and body. Um, she emerged in the mid 1990s, uh, around the same time as the Chapton brothers but uh, didn't really kind of gain sort of notoriety till some time after that. And she found her own path. I think that's also what's inter interesting about Rebecca Warren. OK, I'm, I'm drawing to the close, and I'm just going to end um, with an example from my art therapy supervision um, practice. Um, because out of um, Gordon's contradictions, I would... I thought I'll just select knowing and not knowing, certainty and doubt as one of the probably most um, difficult contradictions that we as art therapists have to work with. Um, and when people come to see me for supervision, that's exactly what they come in the door with, a great sense of not knowing and a great sense of doubt. Last night I spoke, was speaking to somebody and... I said, I think what we've been talking about this evening is you just really need me to say that's okay, you know, to give my approval to what your, to what your practice is doing. So this was an interesting uh, session, supervisory session that I had fairly recently, and I have got permission from the client to show these images. Um, they're made by a 17-year-old boy who's been in, he's a looked-after child, he's been in care for about 11 years. And he's just at the point of leaving care. So a really, really difficult uh, point of transition for this, for this young boy. He'd been seeing the art therapist for about um, a year and she'd done some very good work with him. Uh, but she came in the room with these three images and was absolutely riddled with a sense of anxiety and uncertainty. And of course, that's exactly the state the boy's in. He because when you come to the end of your time in care, you're out. You're out of th that system into the, into the real world. And she, of course, had been saying to me, he's just not mature enough. He's not going to be able to, to deal with these experiences. Um, so these three images she talked about, and what was very interesting about the, 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 the talking about the images that the, the boy had made was that we were able to... Um, I was in our conversation, we were able to kind of come to some kind of sense of containment um, that she could go back to and continue to work with the boy. So the first image was uh, the boy had made lots of colours and splashy paint and she described how she actually um, was incredibly anxious about the paint. Where was this messy paint going to go? How was she going to deal with it? And um, so much so that sh the boy got a hairdryer and he tried to dry it and, 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 uh, and it didn't work. And it was, sh you know, at the end of the session there was m messy paint. But in our conversation about that, we realised that actually her cons concern about this messy paint was really her concern about him, um, about what, what happened to him. Um, and how she, as and she described, going over and beyond you know, because she put it in a bag and it got everywhere and, you know, she then put it in the back of her car and, you know, she kind of was bringing it with her. So that was one thing. And then she, we went on to talk about the next image, which, and we talked about a lot about this hole, this void, this hole in the middle of the tree. 
The boy had been bringing to her two stories about his life that, you know, he'd been terribly abused, terribly neglected from a very, very young age, that he was very vulnerable. But to mask that, another narrative of him being, you know, Mr. Macho Man and he could deal with everything. But actually, this was much more his experience, a sense of void, a, a hole. Then we moved on to the next, to talk about the next image, which again has a kind of, it's three arms. <coughs> And uh, part of his, his kind of macho story was that um, he, his family was from Jamaica, but actually his, his family was probably not from Jamaica because a lot of his stories were exaggerated. But it was in this, this image that we kind of got to the idea about the in-between. This is me and the supervi supervisee, and that the hole was in-between. And there was something about her trying to hold all this wet paint of being in the in-between. And of course that's exactly where he was, in this in-between, in this in-betweenness. So I think that gives you a little taste of how the image might be used in art therapy and how contradiction and ambiguity is something that has to be held by the therapist, by the supervisor, for the client. So, I just end. Creativity is a huge and at times elusive, immersive topic. <laughs> and we all experience it differently. Although much of this lecture has been informed by creativity as an expressive process, because of my art therapy background, we mustn't forget that it is also a discipline. There are skills and knowledge to be learnt and that informs our practice about ourselves and about others. I hope I've given you a bit of a framework to think about creativity and your art practice and those of the clients you work with.